This is the OGM Open Global Mind call for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. Um, I was just asking Hank uh, whether in Europe there were many protests. And he said not that many. <clears throat> However, uh, Dutch Memorial Day is coming up May 4, and there's a lot of prep for Memorial Day that uh, indicates they're really concerned there might be a, a bunch of protests. And uh, Hank was wondering if the similar thing is going to happen across Europe in different ways. So, we don't know. Uh, Mike, you have your hand up immediately. You came in and <laughs> shot to the front of the queue. What's up? Uh, you're also muted. I want to very quickly introduce somebody who's also just joined. Smari McCarthy is tuning in from Iceland. Yeah. Um, we met about eight or 10 years ago for the first, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure where we first met. Uh, we had a wonderful experience here in Washington um, where we were worried the FBI was trailing him. But um, he has now done some amazing things. Uh, he was doing amazing things then. Uh, he was the uh, chair of the Committee of the Future in the Icelandic Parliament. He's a technologist. And the reason I wanted to introduce him to this group is to let him know, let you know a little bit about who he is and to advocate for us devoting um, one of our sessions in the future to a discussion of what can be done with global environmental data because he's got this incredible project to basically create an open global mind for the sharing of spatial data for all the different layers of data from mine waste to CO2 emissions to uh, temperature to avalanche hazards. I mean, it's it's like a, it, 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 it's a little bit like those uh, wonderful sci-fi movies where you just ask a question and the answer comes from 15,000 or 1,500 different databases. But that's uh, Mari, I, 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 I gave you a strange introduction. You can give two more minutes maybe and then <laughs> And and maybe if you can type into the chat your contact information, uh, he's he's got to leave pretty shortly. But uh, I, I I I was just on the line with him, and I thought this is cool stuff. <laughs> so Smari, yeah, thanks. Smari, if you uh, can say. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll I'll just be brief because I know you're uh, on to other topics, and thanks for for inviting me in, Mike. Um, so yeah, I I don't think anything's misrepresented there. I think we first met in Budapest, um, and. Honestly, yeah, the these ideas about, um, you know, if you go back to like uh, uh, Valentin Turkson and uh, Francis Heligan's ideas about the global brain and and take this kind of like, OK, we got all this data now, we got all this compute capacity. How are we going to use it to actually move away from this kind of uh, remedial um rushing behind like the the ambulance of of existence uh you know trying to fix things into a more kind of let's actually manage our existence in a in a coherent and meaningful way uh approach that's kind of that kind of thing very much excites me so uh that seems to be where you guys are going i have uh, i'd love to actually manage to stay and uh, hear more but i've got to rush off to another meeting but but yeah generally speaking Everything I've worked on, whether it's in politics or technology or, or uh, whatever else it is, uh, it, it seems very random from a, from an outside view. But my understanding is always, you know, I, I always feel like I'm standing in at this intersection where uh, technology and society are kind of casually colliding. And I'm trying to kind of direct traffic a little bit or at least try to reduce the number of, of painful collisions. And if that can be useful to anybody, then then that's great. So anyway, I, I'd love to learn more about what your group is up to, and I might listen in for a few minutes if that's okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining. Um, I've been stalking you for a while. I, I added you to my brain in 2009, and I've got you connected to OCCRP, which I learned about by meeting Paul Radu many years ago, which is the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Uh, and then also the Icelandic Society for Digital Freedoms, uh, and a few other kinds of things. It's a, it's really lovely to have you on the call here. Thank you for, for joining us. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Mike, you're muted again. Smarty is one of those people who has this. the resume of a seven of a 95-year-old, but he's uh, obviously quite a bit younger than that. <laughs> exactly. And and, and someday we, I'd love to someday I'd love to buy you a beer and hear the story of how the Icelandic constitution did not get ratified. 
Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to buy you a beer or two and, and uh, yeah, hear that. Uh, well, tell that story and hear your take on it. So, yeah. We, we, just, we just arranged to meet in Iceland. Uh, Kathleen and I will be there in the first week of August. So if you want to fly on over, we can have a beer together. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> or we'll zoom, in, we'll, we'll zoom in with you. April and I both spoke at a small conference in Iceland years ago. We loved it. It's, it was just a, it's a great place. Yeah. Um, we might schedule, if you're interested, Smari, we could schedule one of these calls around the topic of the Icelandic constitution and, and some of your goals about rethinking how we organize ourselves. We, um, we, I hosted four separate calls around uh, governance, just trying to figure out like what's working in governance around the world. And uh, we, we sort of held those outside of this schedule because this is our standing weekly call. Um, but that might be interesting. And if you, if you could make the time, that would be uh, a terrific thing to focus on. Uh, I'd love to. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the topic for today is the protests that are happening on campuses. It's also a carryover of uh, we, we had two calls about um, basically the Gaza situation and how that's uh, working out as trauma and how we process trauma. Uh, there's a whole series of things that are kind of collect collected and connected up here. Um, and I, I think that we, I would, I would love to ask everybody if you'll use the chat for a second um, before we start in on talking and just put what are the major important questions you have about the situation, about the campus protests, whatever set of issues that collects up for you, what are your questions? What are the things you'd like to know that would help you um, either clarify the situation and learn more about what's actually happening on the ground or improve the situation? Meaning uh, questions about process and how this might be turned to some functional use uh, over time. So if you want to take a moment, let's just go uh, quiet for a second and don't wait, just go ahead and start typing into uh, the chat. What are your questions? What do you, what do you want to know? Uh, and they can be small detailed questions. They don't have to be the big monster question all at once. I brought this question up yesterday on the Fellowship of the Link call, and we immediately dove for half the call uh, into the topic, and I learned a couple interesting things, one of which appeared to be um, that outside influences 
there's very little proof of outsiders interfering, in particular on closed campuses like Columbia, where you have to have, to have a, an ID to get in uh, and things like that. This is different on very open campuses, which I think still exist in the country. Uh, and that was interesting. And then another observation was that the way our police are trained currently, you don't call in the police to de-escalate anything because the police have no de-escalation tactics left. The police are only going to pour kerosene on the fire. So once once you've rung in the police, um, the observation was, and I agree with it largely, you are going to you are going to send things bounce things up to a higher level somehow. Uh, Gil, go ahead. Um, it's not only the police aren't trained well in de-escalation parts. Can you hear me through the mask? We can barely we can barely hear you through the mask. Oh, okay. uh, um, do you have earbuds in? Yeah, somebody. Go, I'll change the setting. Somebody You're, else go ahead. And I'll be a, back. It's in a, a little second. better now. Go, go ahead. Okay. So uh, it's not only the police aren't trained for de-escalation tactics. Police in the United States are poorly trained to begin with. The training period is 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 stunningly short compared to what it is in other countries. And so these men and women are sent into dangerous, difficult situations that require split second decision making without their bodies having and minds having been trained and conditioned to be able to handle them effectively. Okay, your the mask is actually interfering a ton. So I think I'm like two thirds of what you said. Um, thanks, Gil. Uh, to wit on police training, I, there's a whole riff I have about Dave Grossman, who wrote a book titled On Killing, which is about the psychology of killing, which is really very interesting. And I read it and I used to quote it a lot until I discovered that his next career path was uh, inventing bulletproof warrior training for police, which a lot of US police departments have been through. So when police do get training, the training they get, as far as I understand it, is um, when you're on the street doing something, it's you or them, and they could kill you. So empty your clip, basically. And you have uh, qualified immunity if you if you you know need a, an argument for why you're not going to get prosecuted or whatever. So we have been trained. We have been up up armoring our police. We've been giving them gear that came off of Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we have been training them on how to kill quickly, and we have not been doing what a lot of other countries do which is uh, training them in de-escalation, taking away weapons, a whole series of other kinds of things. So, um, uh, so there, uh, and I don't want to digress into that particular piece of, of this whole set of logics, but, uh, but it's interesting as well. Uh, Stacy, please go ahead. Yeah, since we've been talking about trauma, let's not also discount the amount of trauma that police officers have and the fact that many of them do come from the military. Um, I also wanted to touch you when you were saying about um, it just dawned on me the difference between a public institution like UCLA and Columbia, the fact that it is private and that they did take so long to call in the police. It made me think of, you know, the parents, how they would value that the parents would not want the police to be pu pulled in. It just I don't know, that was the first time I thought about that. I mean, personally, I was glad that they didn't call in the police until they took over the building. Once they took over the building, for me, that's when the line was crossed. And yes, there may have been fewer outside agitators, but those outside people do make a big difference and they do get onto campus. Um, so I think one of the reasons why I put, uh, maybe there's some kind of web of trust or whitelist capacity that would allow people to understand who were known actors and who were outside actors is that maybe the crowd can help self-report self those kinds of things. I'm, I'm really interested in transparency into what's happening and access closer to the people actually doing things. What we wind up hearing is narratives and meta-narratives that are, that are washed over this uh, from outside in different ways. Let's go Judy, Gill, Doug. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, you'll need to unmute, however. Still not there. Where'd your Zoom? Where'd your Zoom unmute go? No, still, still muted. And I can't. Uh, there you go. Cool. Um, 
I was just going to reinforce <clears throat> what you said about the de-escalation issue, because bringing the police in is definitely going to, if you bring the police, it will inevitably escalate because that's their behavior in the process. Um, but I think that one of the issues is really what is free speech and what is the definition of free speech in terms of the direction that it goes. And it's so important to preserve it, but I don't have the exact definition that's going to allow us to see our way through this, this complex situation. I do believe that the university was really responsible for what ultimately happened because if they hadn't brought in the police, um, it would have turned out quite differently. Which university? Are we talking, I think it's important to separate the two different, at least between Columbia and UCLA, two very different situations, in my opinion. I was strictly talking about the Columbia situation. Um, but I Gilligan, think Columbia, Texas, Columbia didn't do the right job of defining what was appropriate demonstration on their campus. And pretty much whenever you allow the demonstrations to continue after normal hours of the campus, you're going to end up with people coming in overnight, other behaviors, people that are going to escalate. And I think the university could define and use campus security to monitor ex exhibitions during the day. But when the university's closed, then there's not an assembly of right available in the evening. Um, it was also pointed out in the, in the fellowship of link call that there is a long and time honored, in some sense, almost a warmly retrospective memory of protests on campuses where buildings were taken over and things like that. We think of the Vietnam protests and, and so forth. Uh, and this happens, it's not, uh, it's not lethal and dangerous. And I think that that boundary between what is free speech and what is dangerous speech, as opposed to hate speech, that's an interesting uh, distinction to, 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 to draw. And then what activities are okay for protests and demonstration and where is the line? I think those boundaries are super interesting to, to think about here. Um, well, Gil, go ahead. Uh, can sorry, I just Judy. add something? Yeah. Um, because I was on campus, my freshman year was the year of Vietnam and demonstrations. And there was a major conflagration of students on the quad for a whole day but the university didn't interfere with it. And it was a daytime assembly and it was just the students. It helped that we were not in an urban area that, I mean, we were in Rochester, but Rochester didn't have the penetration potential that New York did. Um, so I think it helped that we were somewhat isolated, but I think keeping it to what the university manages in terms of a free assembly at the university of people who belong to the university, not outsiders, is a, a, a spe specific dimension that will warrant some attention and policy. Um, go ahead, Gil. And Samari, thank you for being on the call. We really appreciate your, your um, jumping in. Go ahead, Gil. Can you, hear me, can you hear me better now? A little bit better, yes. Okay, so I've got noise canceling so I'm on the metro, so it's best we got. Um, uh, I, I went to college in the late 1960s. I didn't have a single semester in campus that had shut down for one reason or another. So I'm into the open air kind of world. I think there are questions both about the limits on free speech and also the, the difference between speech and action. Um, and you know what uh, what kinds of actions as opposed to speech or action of those things. That obviously we will discuss that more in this Oh, I just wanted to say something about the police. The de-escalation piece is critically important. A number of police departments, a number of cities, including Berkeley, are now sending in trained social and mental health workers ahead of the police in crisis situations to see if they can de-escalate and resolve things. And only if they can do armed police officers come in. So that's one thing to think about. The, the, the background on this room, which is just really staggering to me, is that it, it, um, Police training in the United States is woefully inadequate compared to many other countries. I mean, we have departments that train police for weeks. We have some that train police for months, three months, four months, six months. In Norway, I think it's four years. Uh, an interesting comparison of what, what, what is, what is done to prepare these men and women to go into extremely difficult situations where their lives are at risk, where they have to make split second decisions. And then, you know, there you know, from martial arts training, it takes a lot of time to condition your body to have reflexes that are different than the ordinary fight your freeze response. Uh, and those, you know, 
we the taxpayers deserve that from our police and they frankly deserve it from us because we're asking them to do an impossible job that we wouldn't want to do and we don't prepare them for it. Thanks, Gil. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Doug, then Kevin. Yeah, I am um, with Columbia. I, I don't know, you know, what the credibility, you know, rating is, but there was an interview this morning with Adams and <clears throat> and and they identified non-Columbia people that they arrested and he announced that. So I think the principle that Columbia is private means that outside agitators can't gain entry is not true. And I think they sorry, did. Sorry, Eric Adams announced this? Yes, this morning. Okay, so yeah, he's he suspect a, he's suspect to me as well. Like I I, I understand, but I'm just I'm just I'm just sharing what what the mayor of the city, you know, that oh. th this was his uh his framing of it. And he basically said we the police um are are governed by the university in this situation. And that um, if they're called upon, they act. And if they are not asked to intervene, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, they're currently the, the uh, DA's office is digging into the, these outside third parties for prosecution. So it's it's transcending a student protester getting arrested to are these people you know actually um, foreign agents and are they subject to a higher level of of prosecution and it it that dimension of this is very reminiscent to me of the um, co opting of the Black Lives Matter protests by extreme extreme right wing. Um, uh, KKK and all of that, who were dressed all in black, and they were the ones breaking windows and lighting fires at night, um, and then attributing it because their agenda was to start a race war. Um, so there's the media version, the hyperbolic extent, you know, extreme expression of, and I just don't believe the bulk of the people, the students involved, are in that extreme spectrum. And the stories of um, Jewish and Palestinian protesters side by side, because there's a very healthy contingent of Jewish anti-violence, anti-war people <laughs> who don't support Netanyahu and don't believe this should be happening, um, having their own ceremonies and being you know, together in these demonstrations um, is more the majority than the than the extremist stuff that is being pumped up. Um, I just wanted to give a footnote on the police on a longer tail um, reference. My brother-in-law is, is a senior cop in, in, in the area I live, Southwest Michigan. But he shared a story about um, back when the war on drugs was initiated and there was a uh, executive level funding of the addition of 200,000 police officers um, on a law and order political campaign. And I'll get the details of this from him and get it to you, Jerry, for, for vetting for, and Pete for vetting. But basically he said what happened was they had to do this rapid staff up. And um, there was a parallel diversity to me that there had to be officers of color and women, et cetera, included. And the problem was where the testing was set for qualification for the for admissions of the force, they couldn't get minority candidates that could pass to meet the diversity. And their solution was to drop the bar on the admission exam to increase the diversity. And in that confluence, you had a massive hiring of people not really qualified in the way that officers before that point had to meet requirements in order to qualify to carry a gun, to be a law enforcement officer. Those people, this is now 
10, 15, 20 years ago, however long ago, I'll find the date. Those people migrated up in through the system into officer ranks and leadership and all of that. So you have a deterioration of law enforcement, the quality of law enforcement personnel across the country. So the policing isn't near field or lack of training today. It is actually a deteriorated quality of the criteria and the bar set and the requirements of people authorized to carry a gun and enforce laws in a way that would be consonant with a values-centered society. So I just wanted to add those data points because it really puts a different spin on that whole end of this. I'm, I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. And just to open that Pandora's box a wee bit larger, um, there was a whole big movement to defund police. Uh, we're trying to rethink policing. All of that happened during lockdown uh, and is sort of in, uh, for me, warm recent memory uh, and also plays into uh, the kind of dynamics that we're talking about here. Uh, Kevin, then Pete. Yeah, I just want to say I'm really grateful to somehow that how this was set up. I've been like too afraid to really deal with this issue, right? Because I don't know what to think and I'm not sure if I can make sense of it. And, and I just don't go into places where I can't figure out that I can make sense of things. And knowing that this group was sending thoughtful things back and forth that, that I've learned from uh, has enabled me to look at the issue and, and, and you know, um, spend time with it. And I, I'm re-engaged with this woman who she is a former community venture capitalist in San Francisco, went on to be the head of the Jewish Foundation in Los Angeles and just retired. And she's pretty militant about hostages. And, you know, Palestinians don't make a, a good, a, she, she said she doesn't care about them much, you know. And so we've been trying to be in dialogue on stuff uh, with some other people. And I've been able to do that. Because she, you know, she has to say, "Oh, I care. I stand with the Palestinians too." But you know, in that she flames. But I, I, I would not have been able to be in conversation with her, and I've known her lots of different ways. If I, if this hadn't been a place where you could figure out, you know, this together with a group of people I trust. So I'm just grateful for this group letting me starting to think about this because uh, I, I just was too afraid to think about it before. Um, Kevin, thank you for that. Um... Since your since your bashfulness threshold is set really really low, it would be useful to us ongoing um, if on the list every now and then you were to ask the kind of questions you're sort of afraid to ask or something, and just ask them, and we'll see if we can source uh, our any answers and and things like that. But um, thanks for putting that the way you just did, um, Pete. Muted. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the buttons. Lower your hand or unmute. Uh, yeah. It's been a while, I guess. Um, uh, thanks. This is a. I, I'm glad we're talking about this, and it's 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 an important topic. And and I, I kind of like Kevin. I think unpacking a little bit and actually talking about it. Um, I feel I, enlightened is the wrong word, but at least moved towards some some small amount of enlightenment. I, I wish I I wish that maybe Jerry and I could convey uh, some of the things that were said from the Fellowship of Link call yesterday, which I I it, it's kind of useless saying that to y'all, um, but and we which, had a which very... I failed to record, so it's, there's no recording of it. Sorry, Pete. And and I'm not sure that I would share it out of context anyway. But but one of our members is both Jewish and kind of passionate about free right uh, free speech and and also very thoughtful and very intelligent. Um, he said a lot of really interesting things, um, and one of them was that the um, uh, the, the situation. So I've got Brown on my on my screen, and now I can't remember the the university that we're talking about. Columbia. Um, Columbia. Um, he's like, you know, all this talk about Columbia and, and external actors and stuff like that is all bullshit um, coming from the media and from the government, you know, the, the, the city government. So really be careful when you, you know, when you hear a story spinning in the media and just because 
you know, somebody in government is saying a, a similar thing doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. Like really open that, open that box. Um, another thing that gets lost in, in a bunch of the other, the other topics is kind of at the core of this is divestiture. So one of the, one of the ideas is, hey, we're students. Hey, we could get our university we could pressure our university to divest itself of Israeli investments and things like that. And, and our friends like, this is not, this is a non-starter. This is the wrong place to start. Um, uh, like Israel is not going to change its mind about what it does because people are pulling out of investing, you know, uh, pension funds or whatever uh, in, in, in Israel. So he's, you know, the, there's a, there's a, a futility underneath the the whole idea of this protest that is interesting at least to think about you know it's it's not going to work um uh he also talked about uh uh passionate jewish people uh really disliking netanyahu and feeling like uh it's a essentially an illegitimate government committing war crimes right now in um in palestine and, and he said, you know, and if you think about it, you know, uh, trying to poke Israel because they've got, um, they've, they've got a loose cannon leader, it's kind of like poking uh, America when we had Donald Trump, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to punish you guys because you, you've figured out how to elect uh, somebody that's just toxic and, and terrible. Um, Switching topics a little bit, I kind of wonder. There's the in the back of my mind when I when whenever I think about police militarization, it's like such an, a bizarre thing. Like if I were not American, like I grew up with this shit, so <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, uh, of course, uh, we overspend on on defense spending, like hundred x or a thousand x or whatever it is, right? We overspend on that, and so some of that has got to slosh over somewhere. What are you going to do with armored personnel carriers and machine guns and like riot gear and all that kind of stuff? I know we'll dump it on the police. This, I, I have to say, speaking to people who outside of the US, this actually makes some kind of logical sense to Americans um, who grew up with cowboy movies and uh, BB guns and, you know, like all kinds of weird violence with, with guns and stuff like that. But when I think about it as a normal person, I try to abstract myself out of the American mindset. It's freaking insane you know like police are supposed to be in charge of maintaining uh law and order uh they're not supposed to be in charge of you know uh military engagement you know those are like two different things <laughs> and in the in the u.s it's kind of like oh yeah those are the kind of the same thing let's draw a circle around them so i i kind of in the same way that uh, we have a, a way too many guns and way too many bullets um, just because there are a few companies that need to sell guns and bullets, right? And there's so many in the U.S. that it spills over our border into Mexico. And so we have to arm Mexico to fight all kinds of weird wars internally. And then that spills over back into the U.S., right? And people wonder why that happens. But it's like, maybe we should stop like overspending on defense. And maybe this kind of weird mindset thing that we we have is just militarization come home to roost you know come home to roost at your local university where you know like um why not send armored personnel carriers to uh, uh, a you know some might a reasonably peaceful conflict um our, our friend on the call yesterday talked a lot about um the the tenor of how, how important it is to be able to have free speech and protest um and uh, on on campuses and the long history that U.S. has of it, and he said something really smart. Like, of course, if people start breaking stuff, you know, that's that's criminal. But maybe you don't like. Maybe you deal with that kind of separately from the the situation of the protest and a bunch of people like shouting and yelling, right? It's, it's easy to conflate the two. The shouting and the yelling scares me. And oh my God, they broke some windows. And oh my God, they're trashing some offices. You know, there's, there's crime going on there, but you don't want to take a small amount of crime by a few people and expand that to cover the whole conflict, right? The conflict is actually not necessarily the, the you know, a, 
rowdy but not um, destructive conflict is something that you watch carefully, but you don't overreact to. He was he pounded that home in a bunch of different ways, and it it, it sounded really smart to me. So so then coming back to or or for me, kind of the nub of this is uh, a question that came up in that call, I think, and it's you know when does the difference between what's what's the difference between free potentially very hateful speech and incitement to violence? You know, obviously when it turns into incitement to violence, that's that's you know, it can be criminal at that point, and you want to stop that. But he said, you know, as a Jewish person, if a bunch of rowdy protesters are even yelling things like kill the Jews, that's not quite harm. I, I'm not being harmed by that. I'm scared, and I'm on, you know, like alert. But it, that's different from, um, uh, he, he did a much better job of kind of painting the difference between those. But He's like, you know, if it's kind of general and it's milling around and there's a bunch of like foam kind of going on and it's hateful, that's different than a few people in a targeted action going uh, very specifically, we're going to go bomb this uh, abortion clinic or we're going to go bomb this synagogue. Those are, you know, there's a, there's a gradient there, which is really hard to kind of differentiate. Judy said something like, you know, what's the definition of free speech? Um, it's really difficult, but I think it's also really important that we don't like let that drift over into thinking that hateful speech is the same thing as um, uh, uh, in the moment violence and destruction. So there's a, a line there. And Judy said an interesting thing, the definition of free speech. When I think of that definition of free speech, I, it's got to be a process. The whole thing is it's not just a definition, right? You can't draw a line and say, OK, Here's on this side, it's free speech. On this side, it's incitement. There's a, a gray area there where you need to do adjudication um, and, uh, you know, uh, like some deep thought about what's going on and careful analysis, careful thought. I'm, I'm making it sound too clinical or something like that. But um, the, I, I think one of the, the, the simple way to think of this, and maybe the simple fundamentalist way to think of this is, you know, we can just draw a line and, and if somebody's, if somebody's saying kill the Jews, that's, you know, that's on, on the wrong side of the line, right? And maybe it's not, you know, it's, there's a very contextual thing there. Um, uh, so that, that uh, amount of context and the amount of uh, judgment and, and thinking about it is really hard and unpleasant and i don't want to think about you know where that balance is but it's also critically important to do that balancing and thinking and judgment thanks and i apologize i, I don't mean to offend anybody and, and i don't think i don't ever think that hate speech that is productively destructive is is appropriate Thank you for that. I, I want to put a couple of amplifying things in the conversation and then go quiet for a moment because um, I think we need to pause and then go to Patty Klaas, Gil, Doug. Um, and a couple of things I wanted to put in were first, I thought Anand's, Anand Giridharadas' segment and that the segment that was shared on the OGM list was really good. And I, I loved his point of view of, hey, we should probably be really curious what these students are trying to tell us. Because in the past, it was the students who were trying to tell us stuff that we eventually kind of untangled ourselves from uh, in previous decades of protests. So uh, I really appreciated um, Anand's attitude in that conversation. And then uh, separately, there's a researcher who, who I'll put some resources in the chat in a second. But there's a difference between hate speech and dangerous speech that she draws. Uh, and it's a very good distinction. And I'll, I'll, I'll just put the resources in there. So um, with that, let's go into silence for just a moment. I'll bring us back out and then pass on to Patty. Everybody take a deep, slow, long breath and off to you, Patty.
Thanks, Jerry. And thank you, Pete, for that. And also thank you all. This has been a really rich conversation and I'm really glad that we're we're talking about it with um it seems like a lot of equanimity and um gentleness and understanding and care. Um I think maybe piggybacking this feels like a, a bit of a piggyback of some of what was Pete was sharing. Maybe it's not, but I I myself am curious around the I'm just observing and noticing and feel a little concern around the the degree of um, military involvement that is uh, consistently showing up in among these protests and as a response to these protests. And I don't know if I'm the only one who, I don't know who remembers within the last, I think it was two years, the march at Charleston when there, I think the number was like 600 Nazis or neo-Nazis um, who were armed and the police stood by and was kind of like, yeah, all right, you know, have, you know, that doesn't obviously not exactly what happened, but I'm just really struck by the difference of, of response in those two contexts. Um, I'm going to spray about two other, three other points, and then I'm going to have to hop right off the call. So I apologize for that. I would love to hear, maybe not, obviously it won't be on this call, I won't be here, but in the future, just a little more conversation around like, like this really what seems to me, granted, you know, acknowledging my, my lack of expertise in the area first, but um, it just seems like such a strange and incestuous relationship between the United States and Israel and the, the rules of that relationship just seem to be so... Um, odd and strange. And I'm curious about the United States sending their police officers over to Israel to get trained by the IDF and ILF. That's really strange to me. Curious about the implications of Cap City and what I understand Israelis potentially training in the United States as well. Um, I could be wrong about some of that information. So just like bewildered and curious about all of that. And I'm also noticing a different point in this call. I'm noticing a really strange, um, I think maybe the closest word would be dissonance. I'm hearing, hearing the shares and hearing and seeing sources cited. And I'm aware, I'm becoming aware that in the last six months that I've been following this issue, um, I, whatever trust I may have still had in mainstream media sources that I, I would have, I would have thought were unbiased, or at least maybe doing a better job than Fox News of sharing, representing ideas um, fairly, I, I have as much trust in those same outlets now as I do in Fox News now. For the most part, and it's a generalization, and maybe there's a couple exceptions, but largely speaking, I feel this really strange bewilderment as I'm hearing still what what seems to be um, trust in in these larger sources that I don't know that I share that trust, and I don't know. I'm not suggesting anyone needs to be different. It was just a really interesting observation to notice, and I feel just in in curiosity around that on this call to continue to experience that in conversations around the issue of Israel Palestine. This could also just be my exposure to what might be considered like one very uh, cordoned off and um, selective viewpoint. And, and, that's, and that's my fault for not, not maintaining and bringing in more um, uh, variety in the media I'm ingesting. So I want to acknowledge that as well. And then I think lastly, um, I just want to, I want to elevate and appreciate what Kevin shared earlier around the gratitude in this group for being able to discuss and explore. Uh, topics that are messy and are really, made for, at least for me personally, I feel a deep awareness of how easy it feels to overstep or misspeak or misrepresent an idea in, in, a, in, a, in an arena a conversation that's so important and so charged. And um, yeah, I just, I, I appreciate that this group can explore concepts together and that we, there's, there seems to be mutual trust that we're, we're doing the best we can. We're not trying to cause harm and um, just uh, acting as a, a playground, maybe for lack of a better word, to explore ideas together. And I am very grateful for that as well. And with that, I have to go. Thank you for the, the rich call. <laughs> I'll see you all later. Thanks, thanks, Patty. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, another side issue here is just general media literacy. Uh, and I I don't mean, gosh, how do we, how do we have sort of handle media, but rather, um, kind of an, a layers of the onion look at various media, at various steady sources of information. And so I, I follow a Ukrainian uh, video blogger who posts three or four times a week about the situation on the ground in the in the fight to save Ukraine. And I trust him partly because the things that he said the day before actually play out the day after. And there's a lot of other people who are busy blogging about the situation on the ground where they're clearly um, uh, offering misinformation but misinformation doesn't, it peters out over time. You, you, can't, you can't build lies that don't actually pan out with facts on the street. Uh, so, so there's, there's a, the one piece which is sort of building trust in sources over time where the sources don't need to be official. This guy, I'm not exactly even sure who he is. His, his handle on YouTube is reporting from Ukraine. He's very, very good at it. 
um, and I care a lot about the fight there. So I'm I'm sort of staying, uh, you know, monitoring that whenever he whenever he posts something. And then I was sort of the the veil was lifted from my eyes on the New York Times uh, during the election cycles, mostly in the horse race reporting and a whole bunch of other kind of stuff, and also in the the dramatic arc or the the narrative arc that was being foisted on reporters and a bunch of other things. But I still consider the Gray Lady one of my principal sources of information because of how they try to report. So I, I find myself trying to tease apart those things, trying to read for facts and then back them up somewhere else if I can. And I, I, it's not my job and I don't have time to go do all that well. But also then to peel back and say, oh, OK, so what narrative could they be trying to propose? And every now and then the Times will have a, a headline that is just crazy ass stupid. And I'm like, seriously, New York Times? Uh, so I subscribe also to FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. But every now and then one of the FAIR pieces will, you know, poke at, at, at some New York Times article. In particular, they like to do that and say, this was just really stupid. And they don't, they don't use that language, but they, they debunk, disassemble, disarm, uh, and contradict often uh, some of the pieces that I would have added to my brain and sort of annotated. And I'll go back in and add the FAIR article under, you know, or opposite the article that I had put in my brain, and then maybe add some more commentary on it if I have time. But but these things are complicated and we can't, the danger here is to decide that all news sources are not credible and therefore we should stop listening to them or we should just hang on to some crazy ass conspiracy theory or whatever. And that's that's been happening to the population, the world's population for the last decade or so. Um, so I think we have a, there's, there's a general task here to find some new kinds of literacies and to build trust over time with sources. And I think trust over time is really important. But if somebody proves their, their opinion works over time, uh, then they're really worth listening to more and their opinion is worth uh, paying more attention to. Um, and I don't know that we do that enough. Um, I know that Sandy Pentland has worked on super forecasters. Uh, it's a neighboring topic also, but the whole idea that some people seem to be really, really good at predicting specific events that are going to happen in the future. Um, they just have uh, better analysis, better intuition, a better crowd, whatever it might be. But the way he learns about that is by asking them to make concrete predictions. And there's a there's a whole sub question uh, on forecasting about what is actually a, a decent prediction, what is not. If it doesn't have a date, a deadline, or a measurable outcome, it's probably a terrible forecast uh, because a lot of things just play out whenever, and uh, you don't know. Uh, so now, sorry for, that was a longer digression than I meant, but these things all feed into the little nexus of, of goodies that we're, that we're diving into here. We have a long queue, so let's go to Klaus. Yeah, the unfortunate part of, uh, of the way that the media is covering these events is that getting lost in the shuffle is the fact that you have over 2 million people who got their, turn, their homes turned into rubble over in Gaza, and you have a dynamic where this is not over <clears throat> because it's not just about Netanyahu. It's uh, it's really also about the public opinion and the right wing uh, uh, members of of the Israeli parliament who insist on uh, getting into Rafa. Right, so. Uh, it's not just Netanyahu being able to 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 say, okay, well, we'll do something else. There is really a far a far greater dynamic involved here, and there is no discussion. And the question really is, where does this go? Right? Um, the 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 displacement of of uh, two million people um, who have lost their homes and their ability to you know, to have any sense of civil life here. Um, it's, it's just an incredible challenge. You know, now they're talking about opening up Egypt and the Egyptians are saying, we can't take 2 million people in here. Um, so, so while we are focusing on these students, uh, you know, getting, uh, uh, having, having, you know, these emotional outbursts about, you know, this has to stop, this can't go anywhere. There's really no discussion on where should it go? You know, what is the scenario here? And so the general public really has no, is that it's almost more a distraction to have these protests going on because it it, uh, it takes focus away from the nature of the issue that 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 is at stake here. 
and the continued uh, danger this poses, yeah, because this could this could absolutely explode uh, uh, into a far more uh, uh, severe uh, discussion here. You know, with with people. Uh, I mean, imagine they're moving into uh, uh, Rafa tomorrow uh, and kill a few more tens of thousands of people in the process. Um, you know, how, how how is this going to play out you know, in the in the global uh, uh, opinion? Really, so this is this is what 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 disturbs me the most. You know, is that this incessant focus on a student breaking a window uh, uh, just just completely takes us away from from dealing with the with the core issue here. Boss, thank you very much for pointing that out to us. That's that's very good to have your eyes directed back to what matters. Um, Gil. Gosh, a lot of things stacked up here. Um, to Klaus's point, Nicholas Kristoff had an excellent column in the New York Times today or yesterday about the usefulness of the protests and what could be more useful. I echo many of the points that Klaus said. I encourage people to have a look at it. Um, three things. Um, I can't even remember what they are. Jerry, uh, you said it's not your job, but it is your job. It's all of our job to sift through the morass of this stuff. Um, again, you know, thinking back to 1960s anti-war movement, it's, uh, we, uh, didn't represent what was going on very well in a lot of cases. I mean, you know, you, you could you could be at an event and see how it was reported and know that it was a different story. So there is that. Uh, I I I do trust MSNBC more than I trust Fox, but I don't trust MSNBC. I've learned because they are they are selling me something just as much as Fox is. They are pushing a narrative. But within that, I've learned to discern what things I can take that are useful and what things that aren't. My friend Chauncey Bell is fond of saying that one of the most important capacities that we have is the capacity to make good assessments of other people's capacity to make good assessments. And so we're challenged to do that all the time. That's number one. Number two, um, oh gosh. Yeah, I think this is not the call to get into the details of the Israel-Palestine-Gaza situation, uh, but I will note how challenging it is when everybody says choose sides when both sides are led by people that you don't like and think are crazy, which is kind of my vote here. Um, and I'll note for the record that um, there have been little news headlines over the past several weeks saying Hamas not responding to ceasefire proposals, Hamas not liking ceasefire proposal. It's all saying Israel stop, but Hamas is party to this conversation. And the the, uh, the, the animosity in Gaza against Hamas has been rising uh, steadily. Um, um, with people saying, like, you know, Hamas decided to gamble with our lives and did nothing to take care of them to protect us. So there's that. Um, the other thing, oh, golly, that was where Pete, Pete, what was Pete? What was your long? What was the thread in your long rant there? There were a couple. Well, the last one. Uh, free free speech versus uh, incitement. Free speech, yeah. Violence. Free speech. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've been I've been a free speech fundamentalist most of my life. I remember in high school, uh, and I'm not here yet. Much of my stop. In high, I remember in high school watching an interview with, with Justice William O. Douglas. Uh, who was that also and said, look, the Constitution says Congress shall make no law bridging freedom of speech. That means no law. Uh, and he held that line pretty strongly in a lot of very difficult cases. Um, and then, of course, we got the other jur jur what jurisprudence decision that says it doesn't extend to shouting fire in a crowded theater. And so as far as the line, it's difficult. It's really difficult. I lean in the direction of no line. And, you know, and I don't take river to the sea as anti-Semitic per se. Uh, in fact, some of the Tanyahu supporters say river to the sea from the other direction. So Fox on both your houses. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm walking across the quad at university, there's a crowd of people chanting kill Jews. What do I do? You know, do I think it's just a bunch of kids mouthing off? Do I think it's a mob that might break through barriers and attack us? Do 
Do I think it's, you know, a mob of mostly good people mouthing off and there's some guy in there who might throw a rock? How do you know? You know, how do you, how, what's, what's, this is a really difficult question, but it's, you know, it's, it's territory where it's not, where the line between free speech and physical threat is blurred and it's not acceptable to damn it all. And it's not acceptable to wait until somebody executes an act of physical violence before taking action. And in between that, it's really tough. And just to um, yeah. put a dot on that, and just let me just say one other thing, Gary. I'm, I've become very clear watching the news reports over the last few days that I have no clue about what's actually going on in these campuses. I don't have anything that can trust it. to rely reliable report of the balance of the peacefulness, the agitation, the hate, any of that. I just don't know where that's at. And historically, I will tend to trust the media and the government to inflate the flames. For whatever reason, they do that. Anyhow, I'm done. I'm going to go back on mute and watch. Thanks, Neil. I was just going to say we're also in an era of stochastic violence, where at least our perceived risk of things suddenly happening that could be really bad, <clears throat> that risk, I think, is heightened in this era. Uh, Doug. So just just a, uh, the lawyer in me. Um, so criminal assault and criminal battery two different offenses and assault is is defined as an intentional act that puts another individual in apprehension of immediate harm and i think that's the the line in terms of the the free speech context from the river to the sea is not directive and projective from one or a group to another. It's not a, it's in the projection of the threat that um, it trips into actual criminal liability, criminal, criminal violation. And the sensitivities of Jewish students on campus and anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish threats, you know, when you zoom out on that scale, it completely loses the immediacy of and the and the subtle distinctions between whether somebody is actually staring at somebody screaming in their face and raising a, a, a bar above their head or not, whether somebody is at risk of immediate harm, in fact. And um, I think I, I personally tilt toward free speech is everything but that. That when it becomes projected violence and threat at that level, we're no longer in free speech land. We're in um, somebody has a right to not feel that they're at risk of being killed. And, and unfortunately, I have to hop as well. But thank you all. I'm up today. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Uh, Stacy, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, Doug and Gil really covered what I had to say about free speech. But um, what I want to share about sources is that the relationships that I've built with people that I don't agree with has really paid off because I don't watch mainstream media. But what I do is I will watch it when it's given to me by somebody I, I usually disagree with, but I've grown to at least trust them in the sense that they have integrity, they're intellectually honest, we just happen to disagree. So, th so it's like they become my filter. And one of the things that showed me that I was on early on, I think it was last week, I wanted, I tried to get somebody to come with me to Columbia because I had a pretty good idea of what I thought was really happening. But as I explained to my friend, I cannot talk to people with certainty unless I check it out. Because he was like, you know, it's this, you know, it's that. I was like, I have to see it. He didn't want to go, so it didn't happen. But what did happen is I was able to get a copy of the Columbia newspaper report written by the student journalists there. And it confirmed everything that I believed was really happening based on private videos that I was seeing from people on different sides. 
and then my own intuition and understanding of what I thought I was viewing. So I just, what I, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is that getting the bad actors on all sides out of the way <laughs> and dealing with people that you already know are worth talking to. Like the video, who somebody shared the video in the OGM mailing list. The last, somebody sent some, oh, somebody, I don't know them. That's why I don't remember their name. They sent that uh, discussion. I think, Kevin, you might've forwarded it to me as well to make sure I saw it. Um, I forgot who the, you're, you're muted. But that was a great discussion. Yeah. That was really a great discussion. I was kind of shocked that they did such a good job of is this the morning joe thing with anand and uh maya was it actually morning joe because that's what shocked me the most that it was well, crap Mi i was like mika, that's on Mi morning Mi mika brzezinski mika brzezinski tried hard the entire time to rile them up and to do the outsider thing and it was remarkable that the three guests basically ignored her and had a great panel but, but if you listen to her and what she's trying to do through the whole thing, you're like, God damn it. Um, well, I but, literally but went back and, she, and I was like, was she just, did she just happen to be on this call or was it actually Morning Joe? Because some I was Booker surprised these that. Guests. <laughs> some Booker booked these guests for that panel and it worked great despite the host. Well, those are the kind of conversations that I usually listen to and it's not on mainstream media. And happily, I think that there's more of more and more of a, I see a lot more podcasting like that. And I hope that that trend continues to grow. And I think Thanks. I'm complete. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Um, Michael, off to you. Hello. Um, boy, I have uh, such a list of, of things that I'm thinking off of what's been said here. I mean, I, I'm I'm troubled most by all the the bad faith stuck stories that people in you know every corner of this have going, um, and and how if you look for if you look for analogous events. Um, and and how they were reacted to before. I mean, people have brought up, um, you know, where were these Republicans screaming about anti-Semitism when Jews will not replace us was the the core chant of the the protests in Charlottesville, as opposed to an errant thing that you know somebody happened to say. Um, my my congressman in, in uh, you know. Um, Putnam Valley, New York, Mike Lawler is the one who um, introduced this um, this anti-Semitism bill that just um, passed, which was bipartisan, which is, you know, I mean, okay, that's kind of good. I feel like it, you know, it adopts a kind of ADL notion of what anti-Semitism is, which is overly broad, um, but sorry, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm going to be flitting around on a few different, um, analogies and metaphors, but I mean, I think about the civil rights movement and the, the, the justice in the civil rights movement that existed despite, um, somebody or even a group of people yelling kill whitey and or you know violent um violent actions as well as peaceful actions or violent actions in the midst of peaceful actions it didn't take away from the underlying just cause um so we have to think about that metaphor and then i think about south africa and the fact that this is this is maybe a little incendiary but you know israel was never a, a jewish nation 
you know, before 1948. I mean, there there is no incarnation of Israel that was that was specifically a nation of Jews that that had that whole area exclusively, and you know, when I was a kid, a Jewish kid, I I didn't understand how people would talk about um, the PLO denying israel's right to exist because i just didn't i mean how could that be that's you know so clearly deplorable that you would decry the right of these people to exist and i understand that better now and you know the the way that the nation of israel came to be is incredibly questionable if you <laughs> if you look at it i mean you know many of us know that um and if you think about the fact that um, if if you want to if you want to look at South Africa and think about the fact that well, at one point we're all from Africa, you know that's where the human race originated. So you know the fact that white South Africans had their colony there among on, on the the lands that belong to their ancestors. And and gave themselves dominion and and you know ruling power as as colonizers over the people who an argument could be made they were no more indigenous than the white South Africans if you took it all the way back um, would a two state solution there that gave white South Africans their own nation have been more just than a one state solution that, you know, we got. And, you know, from the river to the sea, how different is from the river to the sea with the, the notion of the multicultural state that that region generally was over the course of history different from equality from sea to shining sea in the US for you know people pursuing their civil rights not saying that you know the people who are oppressing us should be wiped out but that they should share power equally with us um i i, I just feel like none of these these kind of difficult and politically fraught um, conversations get had and, and metaphors get used and there's no place for it to happen. It's not like, you know, it's not like Joe Biden or Donald Trump could get away with, you know, poking at the complexity of this issue and have it become you know, a part of, of our discussion. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, the, 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 the way that people who, um, who distinguish Zionism from Judaism, uh, Zionism, I, I, I really have trouble with it as a term, but again, looking for analogies, there are ways in which it's not, it's not wholly different from Christian nationalism. And there aren't that many nations on earth that are born of the, you know, the one religious doctrine being the ruler or the, the, the litmus test for legitimacy in that state. Um, and usually we decry it like in, in, you know, the Ayatollah's Iran. Um, and, you know, I, I honestly don't know how many other, you know, religious, re religiously seated states there are. Um, Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I know I'm I'm sort of ranting and poking at a lot of different things, but it's just the whole whole discussion is so disingenuous. And, you know, I'm 
with the spirit of the students and yet, you know, super concerned about real anti-Semitism and not fake anti-Semitism that is opposition to Israeli policies that's just as legitimate as us Americans being opposed to things that our government does. It doesn't make us un-American. Um, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> Michael, you are opening all the boxes and all at once. It's kind of cool. <laughs> um, thank you for that. I'm curious what one calls a completely religious state uh, like Sharia, Ayatollah, Iran, um, and if there's a if there's a determining line for for what that is, and I'm curious what that what that count would be for the number of countries that that are religious in that way. Um, that that's a, a good question. A theocracy is the term. Well, that's right, theocracy. Um, and and for sure, Israel is not a theocracy, and yet it's it's it was founded on the basis of of religion. So, uh, as of July 2023, there are six theocratic sovereign states Afghanistan, Iran, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, Vatican City, and Yemen. Uh, and Israel the, was not founded on the basis of religion, says the oracle that knows everything. Um, so thanks, Michael. And uh, Israel Kevin was not founded had... on the basis of religion. Follow her. Bill Ooh. is saying that Israel was not. What Gil is trying to say that you can't hear is that Israel was not founded on the basis of religion. Uh, can we bookmark that or do we want to open that up? Because I, my understanding was that there was a Zionist movement that created it and that the promise for a Jewish state was explicitly about Judaism. Am I completely off on this? I think we should bookmark it till we can hear him clearly. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's a very good recommendation. Thank you. Um, Kevin, please. Are you, uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. So anyway, I have a friend uh, who works in the Middle East a good bit, and he sent me some, an article from Haaretz. Uh, and um, it's clear that not just Netanyahu from this article, but all of the powers of the Likud and some other more conservative parties like the whole idea of a forever war. Like it's working for their political base and there's enough political bases that the concept of a forever war seems like a really good thing as opposed to every, you know, Gazan little brother who sees his elder brother shot becomes, you know, a, a recruit for the child army. I mean, they're, they're creating lots of enemies, but that's not bothering them. Uh, the, and it's a real long article, you know, this guy and this guy and here's this coalition and, and it's like, because it's a parliamentary thing, it's this assemblage of coalitions that seems bent on forever war works for each of those coalitions. And so that seems to be the political stance that uh, despite all that, the ways that it will bite them and all, all, all the way that it is, you know, to me seems like war crimes, uh, it's it, the political equation is it helps Netanyahu not get prosecuted for his other things, but it, it's all the other. It was just fascinating. It was a really long article. It went into all the coalitions um, that said they want it, they want it, they want it, and the folks who don't want it are losing and continue losing because you know that that idea has become really dominant. So uh, seems like it's obviously going to really hurt them, but that's what seems to happen. So anyway. It seemed pretty valid. I mean, it was it was it was insider baseball. Har, it's kind of you know coverage. So, mm -hmm. thanks, Kevin. Um, Hank, and please feel free to take your time stepping in. And you just posted uh, for the chat as well. Yeah, go ahead. I've I've just posted uh, the way my thinking is moving in the last couple of days uh, because I'm. Also trying to think about this in a Can larger you post context. That in an email too, that's too hard to keep up with. It's great. Just drop it into something. Okay, I will do it. Thank you. Uh, if we post it to the OGM once, that'd be great. Keep going. So uh, it looks like students in every recent generation have been protesting wars. Uh, the baby boomers protested Vietnam. Johnson withdrew his candidacy. Nixon won the election. Things got much worse. Uh, 
Gen X protesting nuclear arms and lack of treaties, no future, we used to call it then. There was lots of non-proliferation treaty talk, but then Reagan introduced Star Wars. It dragged on for much of the 1980s. Uh, the millennials, uh, they protested in their Occupy movement. Uh, I don't really know what's happened to that. Has it been forgotten? Uh, Gen Z protesting Palestine and headline in the papers today, Biden has already said, demonstrations won't change his policies. I remember Lyndon Johnson saying that also. So what's next? And what are the patterns at play uh, in this morning's Dutch paper, at least the one that I read? Uh, this type of student demonstrations were traced back in every generation until the uh, the 1840s. So my questions are, are campus protests effective? And what does that even mean? What do these demonstrations lead to in societal effects? Uh, what do they tend to lead, lead to in the next uh, uh, three, four, five, or 10 years? Uh, and what's next for the students, the ones on the streets and the ones who are afraid to go on the streets uh, and for the universities and for the social order in the cities where the demonstrations are happening and in the nations. So I'm just introducing all kinds of different questions. That's what I wanted to do now. Hank, thank you. And you're reminding me of a question that I think came up on several previous OGM calls because that's what I've got it connected to. Uh, but I've got the question, has nonviolent social action lost its effectiveness? And what and when that's the case, what the hell do you do? Uh, and and I'm and part of the argument for has it lost its effectiveness is we now see atrocities on our little devices and our big devices every day, all the time. Are we immune or inured to them? Uh, how, because Nonviolent social action counts on shame. Basically, what you're trying to provoke is shame in the parties who are creating the problem so that they'll stop and change the setting for the problem. I think that's the dynamic that, that nonviolent social action looks for. Um, and maybe we're, we're post shame in the sense of we're just so much bad crap is happening that we're either overwhelmed or we're just used to it or we've shift uh, shifted over into some other place. And if you're a group that has a complaint, that has a grievance, and I mean a legitimate grievance, because there's, there's grievance politics is the is the the art of fueling uh, bad fake grievances. But if you have an actual grievance now, what is your strategy for getting some action taken? Um, my I have a more conservative friend than I who lives nearby, and um, he keeps making the point. He calls it uh, he calls progressives performative progressives, and he says progressives. Are just it's a lifestyle choice. They move from issue to issue and look, no progress is ever made. They just move like like uh, bumblebees from flower to flower, uh, and no progress is actually made. And we have very interesting conversations at that nexus of of how change happens, whether change happens, and and why these things might uh, might go on. Um, Mike, over to you. I was going to just focus on one point, but this last point about how effective are these movements uh, causes me to weigh in on a couple other points. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was old enough that there were still some people seven to 10 years older than me who had lived through the tear gas and had led some of the protests against the Vietnam War. Um, by the time I got to undergraduate uh, Caltech, um, this was history and I hadn't lived through it. The The biggest protest in the, in the early seventies at Caltech was when there was a rumor that star Wars was going to be canceled. It wasn't a politically active place, but it seems to me that the, the Vietnam war protests are held up as the, 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 the case study, right? I mean, it did change the politics of the country. It polarized the, the politics. We always focus on Kent State and the people with long hair, but there were also the the guys in the hard hats on the streets of, of um, New York City who were beating up some of the people with the long hair, and there were rallies in favor of Nixon all over the country. So I, I, I think 
well, there's not a direct link from the protests against the war to the end of the war, I do think it actually led to a lot more discussion. And partly because they would have panel discussions where you didn't just have the two fringes, you know, you know, if you don't love America, leave it. And, you know, out of Vietnam now, uh, there were actually these centrists who were on the panel talking about the morality of the war and what was actually working and not. The problem now is a lot about disinformation and what you were saying earlier about Morning Joe, the idea that it's not good television unless people are yelling at each other and closing down the analytical glands in their, or the analytical lobes of the brain to focus on the emotional brain. And that, that I don't know how we're going to get past that. Um, I, I, I think we tend to focus on solving the disinformation problem. And I, and I just posted in the chat the most extraordinary third three minute rant in response to what Trump did yesterday in Wisconsin. I mean, he just went through 20 of his favorite memes and myths, all of them wrong. And this CNN reporter just said, this is what he said. This is why it's wrong. This is what he said. This is why it's wrong. Boom, 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 boom. That doesn't work. Partly because Fox viewers have been brainwashed by watching Fox, not CNN, or by just sharing little uh, video clips among themselves on, on Facebook. What we really have to do is somehow change the emotional landscape. And I, I think the only way we do that is, is by getting forums in the mass media, on the podcasts, where you have people with differences of opinion, but they represent the middle of the bell curve and make for more boring television, but more reasoned analysis and more common cause. And I'm I'm I'm, start, I'm starting to have a little bit of hope in politics. I mean, the fact that Mike Johnson now has understood that it's a bad idea to destroy America's leadership in the free world and defund Ukraine. Maybe maybe there's a, a an emerging centrist trend. I I like to call myself a raging moderate or a mad moderate, a raging centrist. And uh, we just need a few more of us and we'll be, we'll, we'll be on our way. On our way. Um, I unfortunately have several different things I'd love to put in the conversation. One is I watched the movie Rustin about Bayard Rustin. Uh, and now I'm watching a documentary about Bayard Rustin, which is astonishing. He was uh, an activist back in the civil rights era he was also gay and relatively public about it. And that caused a lot of problems in his life. But it turns out he traveled to India uh, where he learned about nonviolent social action from, uh, he, he got there just after Gandhi's assassination, but he talked to everybody else and he came back to the US and he was sort of the vector. Uh, he went to Martin Luther King and said, hey, you're doing this wrong. Um, and sort of helped straighten out and, and improve a lot of the nonviolent social action that was being taken at the time. Uh, so I, I, there's a, there's something there about the transmission of ways of doing these things well that that uh, matters a lot. Um, Origin is fantastic. I thought Origin was a great movie, Gil, as well. Uh, then there's a story I think I've told on OGM before about Ho Chi Minh, uh, the famous leader of North Vietnam. Uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, studied at the Cordon Bleu. He was really well educated. He at the end of World War One, he wrote a letter to Woodrow Wilson. He said, attached, please find a draft constitution for a democratic Republic of Vietnam. Please help me get rid of the French occupants. Uh, we did not reply to him. At the end of World War II, um, Ho Chi Minh wrote a letter to Harry Truman saying precisely the same thing or roughly the same thing. And if you, uh, if you travel to Ho Chi Minh, there's a museum of the American invasion, uh, which commemorates the American the, the Vietnam War, or known as the American War there. Uh, and there you will see a little uh, in a glass bo booth, like the Constitution for a Democratic Republic of Vietnam, sitting there. Like, like I saw the doc, the document that that he was that he was writing and sending. And Truman ignored him. It turns out that Roosevelt liked Ho Chi Minh and, and Ho Chi Minh's idea. Uh, the British basically held uh, Vietnam for a while uh, until the French could come back. And there was this window where you could say to the French, "Nope, nope, you're not getting this back." And Truman hated 
Ho Chi Minh and his cause and didn't go that way. So Truman said, nope, it goes back to the French. Then we said, we told the French, hold my beer when the French were killed off at Bien Bien Phu. And we proceed to have, we proceed to have the pro, and I'm, I'm telling that whole story because the Vietnam War was completely avoidable. The Vietnam War was a was hundred times avoidable in lots of different ways. And it was fueled by misinformation like the domino theory uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, in the movie, The Fog of War, McNamara is talking to General Giap, his counterpart on the other side. And Giap says, you know, this was an internal conflict. We had held off. We, we, we had held out the Chinese successfully for a thousand years. We weren't going to suddenly fall to the Chinese and keep going. You made us turn to the Chinese for weapons. And, and so there's, a, there's this general idea of move upstream to the point where you can make a difference. That is a, 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 a thing in systems thinking and bioremediation and upward spiral and a bunch of other things. And I really love this, this idea. And I'm trying to figure out how on a lot of these issues can we move upstream enough or look up at the system enough to make a difference that makes a bigger difference downstream? Because we're busy, we're busy um, in the rapids, in little kayaks that are that are leaky and tippy, and we're busy, and 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 those of us here on this call are privileged to not be on the ground in Gaza, uh, in, on campus at any of these protests. Uh, many of us don't have family that's connected. Klaus, you're probably the most connected of us to things that are happening on the ground in Gaza. Um, and I really appreciate how you've brought um, that, that information to us. But um, we got to figure this out, people. Like, we're, we're not doing a good idea here. And then finally, on uh, Mike, on the article you just posted about the rebuttal, um, one of the things I wished during the 2020 election cycle, and I, I posted a, a video about this, where I was on a panel where I said this, was um, what the news doesn't understand is that Trump's logic is all news is good. Doesn't matter if they're hating on you. All coverage, all coverage is good. And he has a practice of saying something outlandish and, and the leeway, the Overton window that he has torn open allows him to say things that are crazy ass and get away with them and still be the candidate who everybody has sworn their allegiance to. But the fuel that that burns him into, keeps him in the atmosphere is attention. And I wish that the media had gotten together and said, and, and if, if this article debunks the 20 lies he, he said, I wish that the media present at any event would be like, okay, we're going to agree that the moment he's he's ticked off the third or fifth of the of the lies that we, we here's a list. Here's the list. We know that we know the tropes. We know them all. The moment he's done three of them or five of them or whatever number we agree to, we will all stand up, turn off our devices, leave, and not report on this event. It's a little bit like mass shootings. One of the responses to mass shootings is to not report the name of the shooter and to not give them any fame because they're doing this to be the honorable gentleman. I'm forgetting what the name of the mass shooter was. Uh, you know, in the incel community, these are heroes which is such a perversion of, of, of reason, morality, and logic that it just hurts me. Um, but shutting the eye, the media eye, is a really important thing here, and the media doesn't get it. The media, every time the media gets frothed up about something, I'm, like, I'm only going to be dictator for a day, was probably a line handed to him by his major speechwriter, Jonathan Miller, I think is his name? Stephen Miller. Is, Steve, no, is it Stephen Miller? That could be yes, yeah, Stephen Stephen Miller. He's yeah. the anti-immigrant crazy person. And Stephen Miller is sort of the Goebbels, the Goebbels of this operation, very much so. Um, and is really smart about these dynamics, brilliant about these dynamics, and is busy like plotting what to do with you know Project Twenty Twenty Five and and when we win in November, this is this is how we're going to move. And they're far better organized now. So I'm I'm pretty frightened about all this. Anyway, sorry for the long rant. I've taken us to the end of our time, but happy to um, hear any. Um, thoughts like from Stacy. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you said what you just said. And just to add to what Mike was saying about starting in the middle and how it's not as interesting. One of the things that I think we could do, and I shared, it wasn't very successful, but I had shared um, a talk with Sigrid Kog, I think her name was. She talked about deconfliction and um, she, anyway, the point is if, if we could move the conversation with those people in the middle, regardless of what side, to the next step of what we could do, then they're not so stuck 
in their opinions or how we got here, but they're more like, what are we doing now? And it kind of makes it more interesting just by nature. It, you know, it's, it just changes the dynamics a little bit and just changing the question, I think is something that we are capable of helping to push a little bit. And then we need to weed out the people, the voices that say, we've tried that already. It'll never work and all those things and just keep going forward with generating conversations around new ideas and what we could do if there were a ceasefire tomorrow. What's the next step? So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, Pete, small note, uh, thanks for posting about the museum in Ho Chi Minh City, which was renamed uh, in order to make it a little bit milder. The, the War Remnants Museum used to be called the, 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 American, uh, the American Attack Museum or something, American Genocide Museum. It had a really terrible name when it, when it, when it first opened. Um, go ahead, Mike. And just very quickly, um, this rebuttal is, is very nice, and it, but it only works, as you said, if you can shame somebody. And around the world, we're trying to shame people for lying and it's not working, but we could ratchet it up a little bit. Um, David Brin, who I joined for a Zoom salon every week or two, feels he has the most useful solution and that is to gamify truth. That's not his phrase, that's my phrase. But basically when somebody says something so stupid like Trump does that, you know, well, the Democrats stole the election, we have a forum and, and it's, a, it's a betting forum where you can say, I bet Donald Trump a hundred dollars to one, you know, a hundred, I mean, I'll, I'll pay a hundred dollars if he bets a dollar that he won. And we have some agreed upon way of determining that uh, what is true. And I think the fact is we have a lot of evidence that I would win the bet. And then you just have a list of all the bets that Donald Trump hasn't accepted on all of the specific theses that he's he's allowing. And at some point, people would understand that this person isn't willing to put a dollar on the line to prove and get a, a hundred back. I, I mean, it, it is kind of a way to show Donald Trump's a loser. He's unwilling to take these bets. And you could do it for all sorts of candidates. I mean, it would be a very interesting kind of way to to, 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 to get to higher truth. It, it's a little bit like the election markets, the same kind of thing where, you know, the, the, the people put their money behind their reality. Um, and, and if someone's too chicken to take the bet, it means they know they're lying. So we could uh, make book in the sphere in Vegas. It would be really fun. The sphere is the new uh, immersive VR dome or whatever. I mean, I, I, if anybody has any ideas on how to make that happen, you know, and how or anything that where where there has been kind of a truth marketplace, I'd love to hear. And, and David, David's fanatical about this, but um, so it, there it, are prediction there are prediction markets today that exist that are doing really quite well, and there's a bunch of very smart professors and others who are using these prediction markets intelligently so that's that's happening and I that's know, so just looking from... forward we look backwards and say reality market <laughs> yeah that's the phrase reality market i like it You're and prediction right market away. is the analogy <clears throat> i used to be in a prediction markets group with david brin the sci-fi guy right. yeah that's who i was talking about david and i <laughs> oh, Kevin oh, was oh okay. well there you go yeah right well, there, you, there you go. Okay, I thought Kevin, you were just uh, writing writing a piece of uh, Mike's memoir. <laughs> That's right. And Mike, when are you going to write your memoir? <laughs> just saying. I need you to dictate the, it. I need to dictate. You know, the, the way to do this is to find relatives you love, young people, um, turn on your little digital recorder, and tell them stories, and then yeah. send it off to Otter, whatever, whatever, and then voila, you'll have a memoir. At least a third of the really good stuff involves people who are still alive and would be terribly embarrassed. Excellent. So be taping it right now. Sounds so like that, a bestseller. So, so that my daughter could have, you know, a nice revenue stream in the year 24, 2050. Oh my, oh my God. Give it to Lizzie. That would be so good. Yeah. Well, it's my, you know, my tombstone is going to say, here lies Mike Nelson. He stopped stupid stuff. <laughs> Silently. 
<laughs> I was the scientist in the room who said, sounds good, violates the second law of thermodynamics. That is so problematic. It gets in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks, everybody. This has been um, amazing. Really great. Uh, Stacy. if you have a link to the C-SPAN SIGRID COG or whatever, and we can put it, uh, I'm sure some, I'm sure we'll find it. Because I only know how to, I can only do things with my phone. So that's great. <laughs> Don't send it, to, put it on the list. Don't send it just to me. Put it, please put it on the OGM list. Oh, sure. I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, everybody, this everybody. has been really, uh, despite the grim subject, um, this has been really juicy and, and wonderful. So Maybe thank you so much. Maybe this is what for, OGM is about. Maybe. It's not a fruit spread. It's a vitamin. Who knows? Oh, yeah. Thank you for welcoming Smari on uh, no notice. I'm sorry. We were just finishing up the call and I thought there's at least three reasons he needs to be talking to this group. I, if you have any ideas on other people who are thinking about distributed data, data management systems for the environment, let me know. If any of you do, that would be great. It was a great instinct to bring Smari. I would love to build a call around Smari and the things that he's working about, working on. And then I think there's probably also a topic about distributed data of all sorts and open data in, in our future <clears throat> somewhere. Yeah, good. Um, so let's let's plot on that as well. He left the parliament, but he yeah. recruited a couple other techie visionaries who are now on the committee that he chaired. He chaired the committee on the future. What country was that? Iceland, Iceland, but uh, Hels uh, um, Finland and Estonia also have parliamentary committees on the future. And Al Ooh. Gore, Al Gore was the co-founder of the Congressional Clearinghouse on the Future in 1983. Him and Newt Gingrich. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> talk about another talk about another bad influence. That's a chapter for the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh my God, for sure. Wait, Take care. I, All right, everybody. Wait, wait, oh. wait, before you get off, can I just ask a quick kind of mainstream go for it, go question? For it, go for it. Um, so I heard that the whole net neutrality thing just changed, and I'm just curious if whatever change happened has anything to do with the fact that some of the podcasts I'm now watching are glitching all of a sudden, where there it has nothing to do with it. No. Okay. If, if anything, what the FCC just did should fix that problem, but. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I suspect it's probably on your computer. I mean, it, you, you might have too many windows open like all the rest of us. Or your or your phone. <laughs> no, it's on my TV. It's when I, oh. when I watch upstairs and I link it to my, you know, my TV. I, yeah. You have Verizon? On my computer. No, it's Opt Online is my. Hmm. Yeah, yeah Wi-Fi. Quality of my home, my home broadband is definitely, I mean, the speed is, is fine when it's working, but it's not always, not always. Well, consistent. it's only on the podcasts. So that's why I was curious. Okay. I, I can't diagnose remotely. I'm not even. Yeah. Okay. All I'm, right. Thank I have you. enough problems with our system here, but may, may all of your broadband be, 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 be uh, jerk free uh, or uh, latency. That's a good, a, a good holiday wish. Yes. Is it a holiday? <laughs> No, I'm I'm just joking. But may, may all may all your broadband be glitch free. That sounded like a Christmas wish. Carol there. <laughs> exactly. Right. Thanks, y'all. Bye bye. Bye bye.